Hello, welcome to Tuesday Live. I am Omini Oden. Nigeria's independence in October 1st, 1960 came with so much joy and happiness. Joy and happiness that we became an independent nation and our destiny finally in our hand. However, between 1960 to date, Nigeria has witnessed military interventions and even a change from parliamentary system of government to the presidential system of government. Despite all these challenges, Nigeria had already achieved uninterrupted democratic governance from 1999 to date and has grown from strength to strength as one indivisible country. Scholars and opinion leaders are of the opinion that Nigeria has done well politically and economically with many developmental strides in place. Our challenges as a nation notwithstanding, Tonight on Tuesday Live, we shall focus on Nigeria at 60, challenges and the way forward. In the course of the program, we shall be joining the 75th United Nations General Assembly when President Muhammadu Buhari will be delivering his address on the floor of the General Assembly. First is this background report by Timothy Yusuf. Nigeria's independence in 1960 ushered in the First Republic with Northern People's Congress MPC, led by Saamod Bello, National Council of Nigeria and Cameroon's NCNC, under the leadership of Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, Action Group AG, led by Obafemi Awolowo, and Northern Elements Progressive Union, NEPU, with Malamaminu Kanu as its figurehead as dominant political parties. These parties were in control of their regions. The Amod Bello led MPC was in firm control of the North, the same way as Ikiwe's NCNC held sway in the eastern part of the country, while Awolowo's AG was in charge of the western region. The parties did well for their regions in such areas as infrastructure, education and commerce. But there were challenges of nationhood which lie heavily on the regional tendencies of the parties in their individual control. For many political observers, the central government somewhat seemed to subordinate the regions. The first major challenge of journey to nationhood was the 1963 political upheaval and crisis. As the years went by, the first military interregnum came up, during which the political crisis resurfaced, leading the country into civil war. The situation halted the country's political development for a period of three years during which the civil war lasted. My advice to these young people is please uh, do not take us back to those harrowing days. You probably do not know what it is. I believe we have fought one civil war too many in this country. So those who experience it will run away from it. I will urge and advise our younger generation to use talent and brain to sort out problems, not uh, arms. The military government continued till 1979 through its own checkered reign, which brought in the Second Republic. Mm -hmm. At the demise of that republic, there was another 15 years of military incursion into the nation's political history, after which democracy resurfaced in Nigeria in 1999 with the Olusegun Obasanjo's administration. From 1999 to date, with President Muhammad Buhari at the helm of affairs, democracy in Nigeria has had its challenges and vagaries of operations. However, in spite of all this, the experience over the years has shown a ray of hope to Nigerians as a nation that democracy has come to stay with the people having a greater part of stakeholdership in all sectors of the economy. We've had our ups and downs, but clearly the future is bright. A lot, lot has been uh, achieved in the area of political uh, development. An area of economy, we have uh, been able now to uh, start chatting away. There are challenges. Uh, we couldn't meet up with 2010, Vision 2010. We couldn't meet up with Vision 2020. And uh, the present uh, government under uh, Buhari is now uh, putting us into economic uh, part. It's been wonderful. Uh, Nigeria, like every other nation, has our own challenges. Uh, but I see us moving past all of those challenges if we decide to work together as one. 
In spite of challenges of nationhood still ahead, Nigerians are however confident that the system will work for the good of the people, especially in the face of the landmarks being achieved by the Buhari administration. Nigerian challenges cannot be solved in one day. We need time. We need patience. Timothy Yusuf, NT News. Timothy Yusuf background are chronicling what it was up to date. Set the tone for, for the takeoff of the program tonight. And the focus once again is Nigeria assisted challenges and the way forward. It's Tuesday Live, and at some point, our uh, phone lines will be displayed on the screen. And if the lines are open and we're told to you, please turn on the volume of the television set to avoid a hold back. And in doing this, also go straight to the point and raise issues and questions on the program tonight. Also, you can be part of the conversation through our Twitter handle at Tuesday Live. NTA, and as we told you at the beginning of the program, at some point we shall break out to join the live uh, presentation by Mr. President on the floor of the United Nations 75th General Assembly. Well, I have a team of guests right here. I have General IBM Haruna, former Minister of Information. Good to have you on the program tonight. Good evening. Joining us from the Benin Network Center is the Dean Faculty of Arts, University of Benin. Professor Eddie Eragbe. Good to have you on the program. Good evening. So tonight I have May Nasara Kugo Uma, lawyer and international affairs commentator. Good to have you on the program. It's my honor to be with you. Happy Independence, Nigeria. Also tonight on the program is Mazi Okoro Ijoma. Mazi Okoro Ijoma is a professor of history. Uh, Joining us from Enugu Network Center. Center. And at some point, we'll have one guest joining us via Zoom. When that guest is ready, we'll join him appropriately. Let's begin. Well, let me begin with General IBM Haruna. 60 years, three score years as an independent country. Give us your perspective. Am I? perspective is that uh, 60 years in the life of a country that is destined to be great and to play a very vital role in uh, world affairs and in uh, carrying societies and humanity forward is not too long a time and in that time we've been able to move forward enough to put ourselves in the ranking of great or greater nations or more advanced or more civilized uh, nations such that um, we bear the problems that are being borne by these for, for, foreigners of um, all nations in terms of uh, the challenges we face but um, the way forward is to really face the challenges that are arcing to us, that are pertinent to us as a nation. We have the resources, both human and natural. Um, we have the human intelligence um, to achieve our dreams. And we know the challenges that we have had to face um, to bring us to the new challenges of today. And I think in the course of our discussion, we will probably uh, itemize uh, these challenges. Essentially, that those challenges that um, have not allowed us uh, to get up and, and run, and we're still crawling. But we have the resources and the intelligence. If we exercise the wisdom and uh, the tenacity that is required, we will certainly overcome uh, these problems. But um, these problems are such that have made us dwarfs instead of giants. Thank you so much. Kogo, let me veer differently. How did the nation come about before independence, briefly? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, all the problems and the progresses we have harvested during the 60 years, uh, the genesis of the problems and the progress 
should be traced back to the historical background. If you do not know the history of where you come from, you wouldn't appreciate where you are, why certain things have happened, and you would not appreciate the need for you to reconfigure the dynamics of what you are facing in the future. Let me see if within five, ten minutes I can analyze the history of how Nigeria came Five, not ten minutes. Okay, five, five minutes, five minutes. Let's, okay, let me cut it a short. Short, please. Five hundred years before 1960, for example, there was nothing like uh, we were having fragments of nation states. Efik, Ibibio, Benin Kingdom, uh, Ijo, the Ishechiris, the Kanuris, the Fulanis, the Hausas, the Thieves, the Nufis, and what have you. Now, these groups were living in peace and harmony. We are living in peace and harmony despite the fact that you don't have such infrastructural entrenchments we are having today. They were living as brothers and sisters, believing that all of them are from one source, the Adam and Eve. In common brotherhood, you don't hear of any problem whatsoever. Uh, as far back as, for example, when you take uh, 1845, as far back as 1845, Benin Kingdom was having uh, diplomatic missions across the world in terms of disposal of its brass uh, products and bronze as well as West African sub-region generally especially the northern states the Hausa and the Kanuri states through Trans-Saharan trade routes. Apart from all these things you discover that the Portuguese were the first one to start coming. Then in 1804 two things happened fundamentally. One, there was this jihad of Danfordio, which united the northern states under a caliphate. And there was this uh, expedition sponsored by the British government under Lord Lugard. His first coming was in 1804, then the second coming was in 1806. It was the second coming that eventually uh, saw to his demise when he succeeded in seeing to the trace of the confluence in Lokoja. Now, by 31st of March 1808, the British Parliament passed a legislation uh, which other European countries later on joined, banning slavery, slavery and slave trade. But they now turned it back into another thing by trying to acquire colonies through their sea aggrandizement. In 1884 to 1885, there was Berlin Conference, where African nations were put on a plate and then divided among the European nations. Then we saw in 1809 uh, 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 the first arrangements towards the British trying to take over the country. But they did not succeed that until around uh, 1889. When, the history, when, yeah. Okay, in short, from 1889 down to 1914, we saw the first attempt to unify Nigeria. Uh, it's against the previous attempt whereby you were having only the Lagos colony and the Southern Protectors. Royal Niger Company came, they were given the charter to control the shores of the river Niger and Benue. I bet. Fundamentally, it was from 1947 with the richest constitution that we started having the real practical constitutional efforts to have a united Nigeria when attempts were made to unify the southern and the northern protectorate. Uh, earlier on in 1914, there was this amalgamation, but that was the first time when southern northern Nigeria was given seats in the National Assembly, in other words, the Lagos Legislative Council. They were given seats and that brought about the problem between the southern part and the northern Nigeria, considering that the, the, the big size of northern Nigeria, the population, the mineral deposit and the rest, so by virtue of which uh, uh, problems started emanating. In 1947, we got Richard's constitution that talks about the need for formation of political parties. And then political parties started getting formed, tailored towards uh, uh, regionalism, and ethnocentrism, where you have the NC, uh, uh, Northern People's Congress from the North, Northern Elements Progressive Union from the North, uh, you have the United Middle Belt Convention from the Middle Belt, you have the NCNC, the Action Group, and the rest. Now, these groups culminated into trying to see who will outwit who. 
the NCNC and the Action Group were led by sound intellectuals, uh, media journalists of renowned recognition all over the world, Dr. Namdi Azikwe and uh, late uh, Chip Obafemi Awolo of blessed memory. Now, uh, the North was educationally backward. But when it came to the issue of election, they saw the use of the number by democracy. As a result of which, in 1957, uh, 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 Avokratapa Baleo got elected as a prime minister. But earlier on in 1956, Queen Elizabeth paid a visit to Nigeria. It met, and uh, that time, uh, Sir Amadou Bello, as the leader of the Northern People's Congress, said no. As the leader, I wouldn't like to be the prime minister or to win the fruits of the descent. Let somebody from the minority tribe, somebody more intellectually exposed than me, somebody who was a former minister of foreign affairs and permanent representative in the UN, he now brought about a worker, Tapa Bolewa, and decided to stay there. And then in 1959, the legislative uh, uh, elections too gave uh, upper hand to the uh, uh, Northern People's Congress. So as a result of which this rivalry and the rest uh, cropped up, and then we started having teething pro problems after the 1960 independence, which uh, some few years thereafter it culminated into uh, military overthrow in 1967 uh, down to 1970, and uh, which continued uh, and claimed over 3 million lives and lasted for about 30 months. And at the end of it, on the 12th day of uh, February 1970, we saw the end of the Civil War. And the end of the Civil War marked a watershed because before the Civil War, Vice Republic nationalists were seeing it as a national duty, a cherished profession. Maybe you need politics, to make, it, make it your history brief time. Yes. So politics, yeah. politics was seen as a game of evolution of statesmen, evolution of people that will be the guardians of morality and the progression of the nation. Then that time they were united and uh, everything was done in harmony as common brothers. You will see them moving during all the constitutional conferences in London and what have you. They were moving in unity and purpose. Nigeria was their own thinking every day. When they are sleeping, their dream is common man. When they are uh, meeting, they are putting heads together to see to the advancement of Nigeria. And that was the spirit. But immediately the military came and for about 15 years of the military, this thing, we lost the focus and the direction of the statesman uh, in the politicians. And then Second Republic came, uh, some of the few elements that remain in the Second Republic uh, decided that uh, uh, who should become the president in Nigeria as well. As, as in the North, for example, under the NPC, we were having four candidates. Out of these four candidates, Professor Ia Abubakar... We need to make it brief. Uh, well, yes, let yes. me just summarize. Let me tell you, Sule Damasa Nankano, Malam Adamuchuroma, and uh, let Ibrahim go, so uh, somebody that was aspiring to become a senator was immediately called and uh, he was considered to be the most suitable person at that time in the person of Al-Hadi a minister under the uh, Balewa regime and then uh, got himself in. Unfortunately, the Second Republic did not last long, just uh, within a period of four years and uh, Maybe let me three months. The Second yes, Republic, yes. we'll come to other perspectives. I love the history of this. Yes, Let's yes. go to uh, Benin. We'll still come back to you to conclude on that because the history is quite vast and it will help of bend back was to bounce right, forward to right. where we are. Yeah, you. So you stopped at Second Republic. Yes. Beautiful. Thank now you. let's go to Professor Eragbe. Professor Eragbe, you heard from the opening thoughts of uh, General IBM Haruna. Two clear statements he made. Uh, besides what Kogoa said, he looked at a generic picture of where Nigeria came from to where we are and he used the words that even at 60, Nigeria is still crawling. We are yet to run. What's your take on this? Well, I want again want to thank you for having me with you this evening, uh, just by way of uh, proper documentation. I am actually a professor of history and international studies and diplomacy, and um, I'm the immediate past dean of the Faculty of Arts. So the current dean will not think that I'm still trying to hang on to power. Um, right on to the points that have been made, I want to also this evening say, uh, just as we are getting to celebrate our 60th uh, Independence Day anniversary, it brings to the fore again the importance of teaching history to our citizens. 
uh, because as rightly captured by the general, retired, it is that we must know where we're coming from, the problems and challenges we've been facing, the successes we have had, and then those definitely can guide us as we try to navigate forward to be a great nation. Uh, the fact is that Nigeria has actually had its great moments as uh, captured by the general again in terms of potentials. By the time we became independent in 1960, um, we had a lot of uh, expectations as a people. And uh, don't forget that there is this uh, title that we have been using for quite some time uh, which has been the giant of Africa. And that has to do with the resources we have, our population, and of course, the great things that we've been doing as a nation, uh, which is, has been exhibited clearly in the international arena. One or two things I want to put in context so that um, we can understand the challenges we're having of nation building is that it's not quite the correct picture to say that uh, Nigerians were living harmoniously together uh, before independence or before the coming of the British, so to speak. The fact is that, um, like many other parts of the world, in this part also, different kingdoms, uh, empires, and all were emerging, and a good number of them came by way of conquest. And um, that is important for us because today, when we are trying to talk about the fact of how to move ahead within the context of the issue of restructuring and all of that, we sometimes used to, uh, we tend to create the impression that there were these homogeneous blocks, three major and other minority ones that were in place. But the fact is that we can say from a historical perspective that the coming together of these major blocks as we see them today has been as a result of trying to negotiate within the Nigerian state. And so, how have we been doing? It is that we started on a negotiating slate by which when constitutions were being given to us by the British, we had disagreements and then constitutional conferences had to be held and in those constitutional conferences, different regions were now being represented. And we must bear in mind that on the eve of our independence, there was a minority question, which even led to the uh, commission being set up where some believed that they were not going to be taken care of within the Nigerian nation since major groups were going to dominate in different regions. And so one major problem that Nigeria is still contending with today which has been resonating in most of the discussions and even conferences that have been taking place, including the 2014 conference, where I was privileged to be a member, because that is uh, the one that was put together in Abuja, has been how do we really stay together as a people? That has been a major debate. And in addition to that, is that in terms of social infrastructure, meeting the needs and expectations of Nigerians, Unfortunately, why we seem to have made major uh, achievements, taking great strides in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of roads and others, what we are seeing, unfortunately, is that there is an element of retrogression, which is quite disturbing. And we are talking of the good old days. For our elders that are in place, they want to say, oh, when we were in school in those days, we have functional laboratories, we have uh, educational systems that could produce people that could compete anywhere in the world. Our hospitals were functional and we could perform major operations and things of that nature. Our roads were okay, but where are we today? And then, our constitutional provision has always recognized the fact that, as I have mentioned, we have challenges of nationhood and there is a provisions deliberately put there to see how we can integrate and build a united nation, a united country. But unfortunately, what do we have today? Uh, different groups are there dominating the Nigerian political space. With due respect, you are hearing the Arawa, you are hearing Afeni Ferry, you are hearing Indigbo, and many others. And that was not the dream, of the, I'm sure, of the founding fathers of our nation. It was that we will, while recognizing our differences, build a united, strong nation where though tongue and, and all might differ, 
we will work strongly together. And that is why, for example, we find that in our constitutional provision, federal character matter were built in so that no section will fail to be left out. But is that the feeling today that everybody is being carried along? Then also, in terms of providing for the people, that is, meeting the needs and aspirations of the people, employment and many others, there is no doubt that the government is doing a lot to address the problems. Professor Ragbe, I'll come to you to sustain your so position. Many, Let me hold it there for now. I'll come back to you, please. Let me quickly introduce uh, Dr. Kayode Ajulo, lawyer, joining us via Zoom in Abuja. Good to see you on the program tonight. In London, please. He joined us via Zoom in London. Good to see you via Zoom tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank Please, I'll come back to you. Let me go to Enugu. I'll come back to you immediately. Thank you very much. Now, from Enugu, from Enugu, we have uh, Mazi Okoro Ejoma. Mazi Okoro Ejoma is a professor of history, journal from Enugu Network Center. Mazi Okoro, you have heard the opening thoughts on the program tonight. And... Uh, so far, so good. Uh, Professor uh, Rabbi is talking about uh, elements of retrogression, yet we are still together. Three score years, despite all the uh, teaching problems, we are still together as a country. What's your perspective? Well, um, first and foremost, I want to strike a, a compromise by what uh, my colleague in Benin and uh, a previous speaker about uh, the Nigerian papers before the imposition of British rule. Uh, one has said they lived in, a, in love, in amity and so on. Um, I think there was some truth, uh, there, there's some truth about that, that there were uh, ties that uh, bound the people together. You had the rivers, you had all sorts of things. and. Uh, the products, uh, the economic ties we had, uh, but that it was also not where people didn't have their differences, and some of those di uh, differences we have uh, seen. So much has also been said about uh, the amalgamation. Today it's not for amalgamation. And my colleague, who had just spoken, will remember that um, we did hold a conference in um, 2014 regarding the house that Lugard built, that is the amalgamation. And we pointed out some of the problems we have uh, had. And I wish I knew a, a, a country that did not have, uh, or does not have a con um, problems, challenges. As uh, the previous speakers have said, we have had our challenges. Um, part of it, or majorly, uh, misrule. I think people talk of uh, corruption, talk of uh, 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 restructuring and so on. But the central issue, the critical issue is that um, as uh, Bishop Coker has said, the politicians have not done, um, have not done well enough but we cannot say that um, we just can't say that uh, nothing has happened. A lot has happened. Some have tried. Um, but I wish we had the political sagacity, which are for Bezik, uh, Awolowo, Tafawa, Belewa, Madubelo, the type of uh, uh, spirit of compromise which uh, they had. Uh, today, there's so much bitterness among our politicians and everybody is saying that we must treat them with cautious optimism because they promise they would uh, give us all the good things of this life. At the end of the day, we don't seem to get so much of uh, those promises. You have so much uh, selfishness, we are not thinking so much of uh, what happens to the young ones, the unemployed youth, and um, the degradation of uh, life in the Niger Delta, and even around the country. A, a part of the problem we have in the Northeast is also the, the degradation of uh, 
um, humanhood. People have not been able to, uh, people have not been just. They have not shown fairness. Um, the resources of the country have not been equitably distributed and, and uh, that has created a lot of problems. How is it so? I wish I knew a country that um, is perfect. We have had our own challenges and um, we can still do better by harnessing our resources, by, uh, by also making sure that uh, we, we show justice, we show fairness. How can we show justice and fairness? It's only by uh, the uh, equitable distribution of, uh, uh, of uh, our resources. Uh, not being selfish as uh, we find in our body polity today. So I would say that uh, we've not done well enough. We must tell our, ourselves the truth. And uh, some of the greatest problems will have a manner from the politicians. And um, we, the followership, have also not done well enough because uh, we tempt the politicians. And in, the, in so doing, many of them um, succumb. No, my, my colleague and myself, I'm not sure we've done well enough. That's the elite. So these are some of the problems we, we have. And all that we need to do is to enter into a sensible dialogue. Mazio Kuro, I'll come back to you on that. Let me hold you there for now and quickly go back to London where Dr. Kayode Ajula joined us tonight. Dr. Kayode Ajula, I'm sure you, you have followed through the trend so far and uh, 60 years on, three score years uh, we have heard, so we just heard from Mazio Kuro talking about there was so much political sagacity. So what's your own opening thoughts regarding 60 years of Nigeria's nationhood after independence? In trying to make a perspective, particularly about Nigerian independence and where we are coming from and where we are today, I think the first thing, irrespective of what many may say, is for us to congratulate ourselves that for the past 60 years we still remain as one. Because by the time you look at it, even the, the fundamentals you, you. that makes Nigeria what it is, well, one can easily prophesy that we are not supposed to be talking as something that today as Nigeria. Mind you, are we going to talk about our population? Today we have over 200 million, million Nigerians, and which is about a quarter of the entire population of, in Africa. And when we talk of the resources, when we talk of our people, we have done so great. And by the time you check our history by what some of the, of what the panelists today have been able to, to mention, you will realize and you find out that it is that Nigeria is prepared not to be where we are today. Are we going to talk about tribalism? Today, many people will say that it is now tribalism, tribalism has been on. But by the time you take back to history, one of the one of what the British use to, to, to play us against each other is this tribalism. That means that tribalism has been on for long. And many other issues. So for us to still remain as one today is something that worth celebrating. And as we do, as we are doing that, I think we need to take reflection from where we are coming from. How do we be? What, what how, 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 are we, how are we feared and what is the next? I think that's one of the things we need to discuss. That in the next, after 60 years, though many people will tell you that for a man to be 60, he must have come of age, he must have been able to now stand properly. I'm not saying we should use that as an excuse of inefficiency and what is happening in our country. But it is the best way to know where we are coming from, what have been the problem, then we can now move forward to now say, from now, this is what we're going to fix. Yes, there are many things our law as a lawyer, that is one of the things that I'm more interested in. That if it's well implemented, we will not have any problem about some of the issues. When some somebody is talking about ethnic domination, in our law we have we have good provisions that need to take care of that. But the question is that are we as Nigeria, even as government, both Nigerian people and government, have been able have we been able 
to really ensure that we follow that to, to in total. Then again, even our political, uh, the way our political experiment, even particularly democratic experiment, in as much that this, this is the best, and uh, we as Nigerians be able to really, to really follow the tenet of democracy to, 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 to be able to say, yes, it's you. Then if you now go to the issue of economy, particularly about the crime, about corruption, Yes, today some people will tell you that corruption is on one side or not. I need to say this today from the little I know about this country. Corruption is everywhere. And when it comes to issue of corruption, it knows no bounds, it's no no tribe, it's no 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 religion, nothing. It is about who and who and who is dealing with Nigeria. These are the things I believe we need to really check. These are the things I believe that we need to, to, to look to look because discussing what happened before yes if you don't know your history then you don't know where you're going we need to know that history and knowing that history is for us to know how we need to continue to live 60 years has passed in the next few days again we'll be talking of 61 62 63 70. what we should be asking today is where we are we going to be by next year by the next in the next few few decades again these are the things i believe we need to see and that's why i really need to raise this issue before as a young man I used to hear about vision 2010, vision 9, 1990, or whatever it is. Today, we seem not to have any vision again. I don't know what our government is doing about that, because it is when you plan, when there's a foundation, you cannot know this is where you are getting to. But today, it seems that nobody plan again. It seems that we just do it the way it comes our way. And these are the things I think we have, we should have issue with. Today, in UK today, the election will soon be on. You'll be surprised that they will tell you that for the past... 15 or 16 years, they prepare for that election. But until when election is about two or three days, that's when we'll be running up and down in Nigeria to know, let us do this, let us do that. These are the things I believe we need. I really appreciate what we have, what, what I've had so far. is like even today, as you, as you even sit back to listen to history, but I think we need to really face the reality and to know how to move our nation forward. So, uh, Dr. Ajulo, and... Uh... That, those are our opening thoughts on the program. If you're just joining us, we're taking a look at Nigeria at 60, challenges and the way forward. In the course of the program, we shall be bringing you a couple of reports. And as soon as those reports are ready, we'll start taking them. Uh, our first report, if it is ready, uh, is coming from Abuja in sustaining the conversation tonight. It is to the glory of God and in celebration of the attainment of the diamond age of 60 by our great nation that I hereby unveil the prepared anniversary logo for this momentous occasion in our national history. With a deep feeling of national pride, President Muhammad Buhari also announced that together shall be the theme of Nigeria's 60th anniversary celebration. Our founding fathers, in spite of the differences in faith, tribe, and tongue, came together to fight for Nigeria's independence. This shall be a befitting tribute to the struggles of our heroes past. The theme the president emphasized will keep the nation united and help the citizenry forge ahead, while the logo, a product of choice from the Nigerian people, forms the critical pillars which the modest commemorative activities will rest on. The neatly encrusted diamond on the nation's map, President Buhari said, symbolizes Nigeria's age of treasure, while the pear and dark green colors remind Nigerians of their warmth welcoming spirit and love, as well as the abundant human and natural resources. As we celebrate this anniversary, this government will work towards greater inclusiveness and look forward to the participation of all Nigerians. For the Chairman, Interministerial Committee on the Anniversary Celebration and Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, the historic event is just the beginning of the various commemorative activities expected to last 11 months. The preference for a year-long celebration is to create opportunities for ownership and ensure that the edifying elements of our nation are made to propel our various individual and collective action. Therefore, post-October 1st activities to engage the private sector and the ordinary Nigerian 
would be the focus of the interim ministerial committee. Celebrating 60 years of Nigeria's independence without doubt calls for palm and pageantry. But the federal government says with the COVID-19 pandemic forcing the global community to think and act differently has also foisted on the nation the imperative of a low kid celebration. In sustaining the conversation, the next report is coming from Lagos. The British government assumed direct control of the Niger Royal Company's territory. The northern area, as was renamed the Protectorate of Northern Nigeria, and the land of the Niger Delta along the lower trenches of the river, was added to the Niger Coast Protectorate, which was renamed Southern Nigeria. Lagos, renamed capital of the South, and Zungiru, the new capital of the north. On January 1, 1914, following the recommendations of Sir Frederick Lugard, two protectorates were amalgamated to form the colony and protectorates of Nigeria under a single governor general in Lagos. Between 1919 and 1954, the title reverted to governor following Lugard's success in the north. He set out the principles of the administrative system, subsequently institutionalized as indirect rule. Essentially, local governments were controlled by traditional chiefs who were subjected to the guardians of European officers. Native institutions were utilized and interference with local customs by colonialists was kept at a minimum. While the system had built in contradictions over the years, the country developed a sophisticated form of local governance. To what extent has the colonial legacies been able to influence governance in a 21st century Nigeria? I will not categorically say that these are a bequeathed legacy of colonialism, but I think colonialism actually played a role in that respect in many, uh, in, in a whole lot of uh, respect in terms of Africa's history of development, Africa's uh, uh, history in terms of governance. Because there's no way a man from the north will go and rule over people in the south. There's no way people from the south will go and rule over people from the north. It could only have been possible through democratic means. Otherwise, the Oba of Benin will rule over Benin. Not even the Idaho the state, just Benin. Only of Ife will rule over just Ife. And also we have very many kings as they were. But today with that democracy, we have just one president overseeing the entire country. Analysts suggest that a more robust approach to governance that reflects the true yearnings of citizens is required for Nigeria to achieve a potential among the Committee of Nations. <laughs> So the report and uh, clearly it has sustained the perspective on the course of discussions and a couple of tweets came in just before we go on break let's take a couple of them and uh, the first one which i will allow general ibm haruna to, to address is coming from saleh baba it says with due respect to the discussions where we are coming from seems to be better than where we are going today where we are today why is it that we are we grow older as a nation we become weak and unproductive how do you react to this give it the way forward well first of all i don't agree with his um, statement that where we are coming from is better than what we have arrived at so on and so forth i i think that um where we are coming from is so much different from where we are. And the challenges of where we are coming from are not the challenges we are facing today. Okay. The challenges from where we are coming from, you can say historically from slavery, from colonialism, from ignorance, um, but from a studied existing cultural existence. So where we have arrived at is a situation where there is freedom, there is liberty from slavery, there is some certain amount of um, uh, expression of uh, uh, democracy, 
and uh, uh, liberty uh, of, of conscience and so on. I think what we, are ha we have now uh, as a major challenge is the crisis of sovereignty. How sovereignty is expressing itself on the impact of the liberties and freedoms and uh, social contracts which we have entered to form our constitution and to give us the leeway for self-examination, self-criticism in order to solve this crisis of sovereignty of the people, the freedom of the people, the contract amongst uh, the people as equals as expressed in the constitution, uh, which must be maintained by the rule of law and um, uh, equality before the, uh, you know, before the law. So the crisis we have manifests itself from the way governance is conducted mm -hmm. and from the way that people are struggling to make sure that um, the, the, the presumptions and assumptions of their subordination, for example, to a structure of governance and structure of authority that were presumed because of colonialism, because of feudalism, because of um, uh, whatever historically had oppressed people, are now being uh, 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 rationalized such that uh, the, 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 the existing civilization allows people uh, to express themselves and to express their wishes and to challenge the, uh, the status quo. And um, this is find itself in, uh, in our wish, for example, uh, uh, to, to restructure the Nigerian state, to, to examine some of the contents in the social contract, uh, to look at the sharing of uh, power between uh, you know, the structures. So it is a struggle that we have to face in order to, you know, to go forward. And I've had in the earlier discussion, um, my friend here, who said North was uh, educationally backward. And I, I think that when we make these statements, we should examine what is the content and the expectation of, um, of education. For, for centuries, the, the Northern um, administration or the oligarchy or uh, the, 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 the requirements of the society in the North that were more pertinent to, to examination had their system of education. The, the, the education provided for the needs the uh, education had to, had to uh, satisfy. Okay. Today we are in a different uh, a, a frame of expectations and, um, uh, and the ends of education. And we have to look at what is the need in our present civilized, uh, civilized state and expectations that education should match because the education of centuries gone or um, colonial uh, past or feudal past is not the requirement for uh, a digitalized modern uh, what you may call civilized culture okay. or more universal culture. So we have to make this um, uh, statement with a little of uh, uh, reservation <laughs> and to face and if we don't do that we may miss um, uh, structuring our, our education for the needs of now and tomorrow and more years to come and be examining things in the in the, in, in the past cultural setting or past ex, ex, uh, expectational setting. Okay. I think we have to solve the issues that face us now to go forward. Uh, how do we solve, uh, how do we maintain a social contract that shares power and sovereignty amongst the people, their representative, and the structures that make the systems of government? Okay. Thank you so much. Let's go to Benin. Kugo, I'll come to you. Uh, Professor Eragbe, the next tweak is coming from uh, Taribo, and if you listen clearly to it, I want to put it across to you and see how you react to it. It is not just about 60 years. Yes, congratulations, Coffetti Ball. But then, what have we achieved so far? You would agree with me that as at the time we celebrated our 59 years, and now there has been a lot of changes. Take, for instance, the price of goods and commodities. How do you react to these tweets? Uh, 
Thank you very much. I think um, a program like this definitely cannot help us to in depth uh, uh, examine the different aspects of our national exper experiment. Uh, but the point that um, we are trying to make here is that for us as a nation, we have definitely made some positive impact as far as the international system is concerned. And then we look around us, just like the general was saying, where we used to be educationally, how many people were there with Western education on the, when we got our independence, how many universities or schools did we have, literacy level, what was it, we know where we are today. To that extent, we are making some positive uh, uh, strides. But the point that has been raised by that tweet, which I agree with, is what really is the standard of living today for the majority of Nigerians. That is the issue that is really very disturbing for us as a nation. When we hear the trillions of Naira, trillions in foreign currency when we are converting to dollars that have been expended that we do spend or actually use every year now an average of about 10 trillion naira a year uh, by way of budget we know that the whole money is not there and then you look at the lives of the average citizen it calls for question then of course we must know as a people that economic price, uh, prices of commodities and all are determined by what we call economic factors of demand and supply, are these things available or not? And uh, once we have not been producing most of the things that we require and we have to import, then of course prices are bound to escalate or go up. Where are we today? This is one of the greatest disappointments I have seen for us as a nation that we've had oil. We discovered it, we started exporting about 1955, talking from Olobri and all of that. We built refineries, and they were working. What really can be the justification that today all our refineries are down, and we are being told that we must continue to import petroleum products, and then that market forces should determine the price of those things, and the citizens whose income has remained almost stagnant, and after long deliberations, there has been a minimal improvement in what is supposed to go there. And as we speak today, just yesterday we're hearing that some states have not even started implementing the minimum wage. We are now seeing a situation where prices are spiraling up because of such things as the increase in petroleum costs. Why are our refineries not working as a nation? It is one of the reasons why in spite of some nations that don't even have what we have, they are the people we are importing things from. It calls for real deep reintrospection, and we must try to address such things. And in the same country, there is so much disparity in terms of what the small elites, just like Professor was mentioning now, my colleague, small elite that are corner the resources of this nation, why the bulk of the citizens are in abject poverty and penury. It is not acceptable. We should be working to be like some of the other nations where there is better equitable distribution of the resources of the nation. We have been crying over time. Look at universities, for example, the public universities, even as we speak today, they declared a strike since about March. We are now in the month of September. Nobody seems to be addressing that matter. And what is going to happen? They are, we are being told now that COVID is now going to allow universities to reopen. The next thing again is going to be that it is now when universities are the COVID thing has moved that agreements will be coming up which will not be kept to. There are certain fundamental things that have made our system to seem not to be working. And then the health sector. Daily we are hearing as we just Monday that Johansu had to call us strike. Doctors always on strike. Today, as a nation at 96, at uh, 60 years old, let it be that when government get into agreement with its different workers, that such things are implemented so that we can reduce these things that seem to ridicule the achievements that we have made so far. Because we have many institutions today, but they are almost not functional. They work for about three months. They are short for about six months. Up and we are always making, it's not the best thing for us. Thank you. Let me hold it for now. The next tweet from 
Abba Hainan is a complimentary to all of us in the, in the program. A very good evening to you all in the studio. My special greetings goes to Barrister Mesara Ko, uh, May Nasra Kogo, Uma, whom I'm seen as my role model. May God make Nigeria witness uh, Nigeria at 60. May God take all of you back to your destination safely. Message from uh, Kasim. That's uh, a compliment. I'll still hold you, Kogo. Let me take this tweet to uh, Dr. Kayode Ajulo. Ka Dr. Kayode Ajulo, the next tweet talks about the fact that it's coming from Abdul in Gombe. Federal government needs to force governors to allow local governments to function independently if we need progress, peace and development to persist in Nigeria. Quickly, please. Thank you very much. I think I am so elated when I learned that General IBM Aruna talked about constitutional, constitutional and constitutionalism and talked about social contract. I think all this has to be with our social contract as a contract the government and the people has together. And this is being escapulated and being expressed in the constitution. So the, it's always beat me hollow whenever I listen to the fact that the state government or the federal government has to be compared, compelled or has to be begged to do what is a simple provision of the constitution. And that is when comes to what actually the issue of this national interest. Interests, which interests are we are we even saying we are trying to serve? Is it the is it the national 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 interest or selfish interest? It is so clear, and I believe for anybody to come out to say I want to contest for if I want to be the governor, I want to be elected officials, it must be within the ambit of the law and within the what we agreed upon. And that is why I always believe that's why when you see some of us really always advocate that the election should count. Because the only way to, to serve as a measurement of anybody as more to more or less to to okay anybody should be when it comes to issue of election but today unfortunately elections seem not to count that's why we think we believe that it should count and i believe until when that won't happen that's when anybody can say that whatever we agreed upon is all complimented it, it is so surprising that it, today the president it really needs to issue executive order to ensure that some governors has to has to do what the constitution has 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 has, has, has provide for like for for the issue of autonomous power for the legislature and the judiciary and i believe it is high time we need to interrogate this particularly when what we call like i mentioned earlier what we call selfish interest and national interest once we can clear this half of our problem will be will be will be, will be really solved because as at that time we'll be able to know that this is what the people want this is the aspiration of our nigerian people it will be against the aspiration of just few which some people do call kappa that is the way it should be the essence of democracy the essence of local government is to the fact that government will get to the people more to the people closer to the people but today the state governors seem to take it the other way and you see the same state governor complaining about the federal government lording over them so it seems that each each at each level they will seem to have our own oppressor left and right and this shouldn't be the essence of governor governance is to ensure that everybody is taken care of or even if they are not taken care of i by by simple issue somebody mentioned standard of living some minutes ago what what they what ensure that standard of living should be is the fact that you take the yearning of the people you listen to the aspiration and that aspiration is being met and that is what it is but unfortunately we've not been able to achieve that and i believe that is why i said earlier that when whenever we are talking of anniversary it is, should be a time for reflection to see where we are where we are going and what we intend to do and i believe by the time we start doing this then there will be a way out hey. Ajulo, one of the things Mr. President said at the launch of uh, the 60th anniversary logo was the need for greater inclusiveness. Mm. How do you achieve this? Yes, we should achieve greater inclusiveness if we really embrace democracy as a model. Uh, section 14, <laughs> of section 1 of our constitution predicates that democracy is the system of governance we should operate. In other words, the will of the people should be sacrosanct. And when we are talking about the will of the people, we should really put all ethnocentric and other cleavages by the side. Constitutionally speaking, the Constitution talks about the interests and aspirations of the common man. 
and for, for, for the fact that you have been sworn in, for example, the president under section 130, you are the president of all Nigerians, the totality of all Nigerians. Now, the totality of all Nigerians means you should not allow any paramodial consideration to influence the way you will appoint your ministers as per sections 147, 174, and 150 of the Constitution. Okay, let me and just hold you there. Yes. I told you at the beginning of the program that we shall be joining the United Nations General Assembly where the general debate is going on. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, back to Tuesday Life, we'll just allow one of our guests speak to his address. Then we'll return back to the topic of the day, uh, starting with reports. So quickly, uh, beginning with uh, Kogo, oh, yes. let me allow you a few minutes to just react briefly to Mr. President's address. He looked at so many things, but in summary, mm. human rights, poverty, recharging of the lake chart, uh, safe schools, international financial accountability, and uh, the last gender equality, and the last point was the advocacy for Africa to have a permanent seat in the Security Council of the United Nations. So quickly, how do you react to that? Yes, uh, it's, it's an excellent speech and uh, I really uh, 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 thank him very much, especially in talking about what we dearly need, uh, that is the need for permanent seat in the UN. Uh, countries uh, uh, all over the world, we are practicing democracy. In a situation whereby you have only five countries monopolizing the sea, with each of them having veto power, to whether the whole of the world decides or not. One country can really overturn the decision of every country. It's really anti-democracy. And uh, I really love the way he really posited that Africa deserves a seat. Otherwise, we are a continent so big that we deserve maybe more than a seat. Uh, Nigeria, uh, if you take, for example, Nigeria, uh, 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 Egypt and South Africa really deserve, in addition to countries like uh, Brazil, India, Korea, Germany, Japan, Australia, and Switzerland. That is one. Secondly, uh, uh, I really appreciate the way he now talk about all the aspects of the UN uh, 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 Sustainable Development Goals, the efforts we are making, that is really commendable. They, I would like to talk on a few areas that I expected him to have touched. Uh, one of the areas is democratization of the world economic order. So long we continue with this type of world economic system, whereby the Western world is the one dominating the World Bank and the IMF, and world economic policies and the use of international currencies, so long Africa will remain underdeveloped. That is well. Secondly, I expected him to have spoke, uh, spoken about the crisis in Mali. Uh, the crisis in Mali really needs uh, international forces to come in because it is ex uh, 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 instigated by the, some uh, uh, figments of terrorism. And when you are talking of terrorism, it's a global phenomenon. And it's, since it's a global phenomenon, it is important to be addressed at the level of the world body. The third one I, will have, I expected him to have spoken about is the issue of uh, the struggle in Western Sahara. Western Sahara is struggling for liberation against the domination of uh, 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 Algeria and uh, Morocco. It is important for the totality of the African continent to really be liberated against all shackles of domination. I really appreciate the president too for talking about xenophobia, uh, whether in South Africa, whether in Ghana, it is important we raise it there and we draw the attention of the world to really pass a resolution against that. And then I, I, I really expected him too to have spoken and thank the world for allowing Nigeria to chair the 75th uh, session of the uh, United Nations General Assembly. Uh, since Professor Mohamed Bande at uh, this sitting today, this is his last exercise as uh, the president of the world body. So I expected him as a leader of Nigeria to really thank on behalf of the people and the government of Nigeria and their, in, indeed the totality okay, of let, Africa and Black That would be fine for about. I think uh, yes. he clearly appreciated the fact I appreciated, that uh, Bande uh, has served his turn. Yeah, exactly, you know. exactly. Let, let's go to Mazi uh, Okoro in Enugu. Mazi Okoro, one of the concerns by Mr. President is the challenge he threw to the United Nations where he said if the United Nations cannot mobilize the world to marshal out a truly effective inclusive response to COVID-19 then a number of things will happen. How do you react generally on Mr. President's speech? Um, in the area of, of uh, COVID-19 I think uh, the president and the country have done relatively well and I think uh, we should uh, accept his uh, statement to the United Nations. Back home there was uh, 
the a frightening situation at the um, early uh, 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 early part of uh, the virus, and I think that uh, that Nigeria has done relatively well. The appointment of um, a task force, ch uh, chaired by no less a person than the secretary to government, with a, a number of uh, top ministers in that uh, task force, they've done reasonably well. And um, uh, it's difficult now to say whether we are having a cough, but what we know today is that we is not. Uh, we are not faring worse than we had anticipated. Therefore, I think um, the statement to the United Nations about uh, the COVID-19 is uh, it's up to enough. It's up to enough. Um, we've been uh, we've been quite effective, I would say, in that area. Chair and uh, back to the program, we shall just take a few reports uh, on Nigeria at 60, challenges and the way forward. And as soon as we are back, we go around all the guests to give us their thoughts on the way forward, Nigeria at 60. So let's begin with the report from Kaduna. Part of the subjugation of what later came to be known as Northern Region of Nigeria by the British colonial masters that existed across the vast and richly endowed region well-established system of administrative leadership, defense, agriculture, and a thriving, vibrant system of commerce that linked North Africa, West Africa, and the Mediterranean societies of Europe and Asia. The vibrancy of these multi-sectoral systems, especially the administrative startups, according to documented accounts, were the motivation for the indirect rule system of governance resorted to by the colonial rulers in the northern region, thereby making the ruling class of the various kingdoms and chiefdoms strong pillars in the success of the colonial administration in the region. The gains arising from the colonial robust administrative capacity of the region accounted for the post-colonial political assertiveness northern Nigeria was able to muster in independent Nigeria, so that till date, the comparative political strength of the region has remained uncontestable. Uh, if you are looking, uh, making some reflection on really what happened, we can learn from the colonial experiences, particularly with the issue of uh, the current realities of governance and politics in Nigeria. I think we have to go back to 1945, because 1945 is a very significant uh, period on trying to make a very uh, analysis on what happened or what is happening, particularly on the issue of geo-ethnic politics in the body politics of Nigeria, because it emanated from that particular period, with the, particularly with the promulgation of the Richard Constitution. The Richard Constitution was largely being orchestrated by the British in order to create division within the country. Despite the obvious disadvantage of the moment, the Premier of the region, Amadou Bello, was able to mobilize his subjects and harness available resources leading to reshaping the destiny of the northern region. And uh, he also uh, tried to, you know, bring the north at par with other sections of the country, educationally, industrially. Uh, he boosted the civil service by sending many, 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 you know, of our young northerners of that time to study abroad so that they could come back and take up positions in the civil service to replace uh, foreigners, expatriates at that time, of that time. As Nigeria marks 60 years of nationhood, observers are of the belief that the sacrifices of the first generation nationalists remain the surest guide to a most promising Nigeria. Our next stop is Kalaba. Ah, the capital of Cross River State in today's Nigeria was known before 1914 as the capital of the Southern Protectorate. One of the most prominent edifices that will present to any tourist or historian a picture of the city in its past as a one-time seat of administration is the old residency, otherwise known as Government House. This building is now accommodating relics for the National Museum and Monument. The old residency building was fabricated in Britain in 1884 
and erected at Old Calabar to accommodate British administration of the Niger Coast Territories. The building was also known to be the seat of the Oil River and Niger Coast Protectorate. Most of the decisions that we are taking about Nigeria were taken in this building. So this building played a very important role in the history of Nigeria. Right, starting from the time of slave trade, Calabar played a very important role in the history of slave trade because Calabar was a trading point. During the era of slave trade, the Calabar waterways was a major exporting route used by the European traders and investigations revealed that out of the over 2,000 slaves that were traded out of Africa between 1690 and 1807, about 3.1 percent of them emanated from Calabar. Other notable features in Calabar is the Marina Port, which was popular as the exit and entry point to the then mainland part of Cross River State. Today, it is still being used as a ferry port to get to Oron in Akwaibum State. All these landmarks, according to observers, assisted in shaping today's administrative Nigeria. The very next one is Enugu. Which has shown that colonial imperialism was responsible for initially laying the foundation of good governance and consolidating the modernization paradigm in Nigeria. The British came in and transformed the local processes of governance as it were because people were governing themselves before the colonial masters came and changed a lot of programs. Some great historians and stakeholders in Enugu State believe that the colonial experiment actually tried to perfect British administration and the process of governance in Britain, Western Europe, and Northern America. They maintain that Nigeria's first leaders after independence, including Michael Obara, Ahmadu Bello, and Obafemi Awolowo, brought a lot of development and imbibed the principle of administration as inherited from the British and invented new ideas on how to combine the British experiences with the cultural beliefs. Uh, people at that time that were rigorously schooled in the norms and doctrines of British governance actually perceived and understood those programs. They were running very well. If you assess the first um, leaders after independence, you can find out that many of them did very well. A very good experience and uh, worthwhile uh, hope that future will be better. The however named lack of proper integration of the learning process from the Western Europe, lack of proper understanding of the things inherited from Britain, as well as taking some of Nigeria's cultures for granted, are some factors that may undermine the country's efforts at forming a formidable force on points of civilization. For us to revive what we are doing, first of all, we'll come back to education. We'll be able to program curriculum that is totally different from what we are doing. On the way forward, the respondents advocated that an emergency meeting of intellectuals in various fields be called, where they would make genuine contributions which would advise the policy formulation process in the country. In Enugu, Chineyemuyi. Those were other reports from Kaduna, Kalaba and Enugu in sustaining the discussion tonight looking at challenges and the way forward Nigeria at 60. Let me begin from London where Dr. Ajulo joined us from. Dr. Ajulo, by way of conclusion, what in your few words do you recommend the way forward for Nigeria as we move on as a nation? We will discuss that earlier. Like what I said, it is about social engineering, it is about what Nigeria needs and it will be and today. If there should be a place to if there should be a referendum, what matter most is that the agitation of Nigerian people is that there is a need for restructuring of Nigeria. And when I talk about restructuring of Nigeria, it is not about saying that Nigeria, there must be a way where everybody should go their own way, but there must be a way that everybody interest has to be taken into consideration. Today we can see some skimmage, some restlessness left here and there. It 
is more of as a result of the fact that some part of this country believe that their interest is not being taken care of again. That's why we're saying that. But in a way that we can have it, even if we allow the constitution to work as it is, I believe such 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 issue will be a thing of the past. I think Nigerian Nigerian government need to reassure Nigerian people that we have a stake in this country and all their interests will be taken care of. Once we have this, every other thing is as is, 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 is easy as anything. I think that is the basic thing we need to start from. Nigerians need to know that they are members of this country. Nigerian people need to know that this country is theirs. And that is and from there the issue of patriotism will be there. Today, most of Nigeria don't even believe that it's another people ruling their country. And that is why you see some people who say it's their government, it is their car, it is their business. They don't see it more or less as a collective things that we all own. And I believe it is the duty of government to reassure Nigerian people, particularly those who are cheating now to say, yes, you will be taken care of. We are together. And with that, you'll be surprised that Nigeria will be, will continue to be the giant of Africa that we want it to be. Thank you. Kade Ajulo, it was nice having you on Tuesday Live. Dr. Kade Ajulo joined us via Zoom in London. Thanks so much for being on Tuesday Live tonight. Now, Professor Eragbe, Professor Eragbe, just we know we had had teaching problems and a lot of drawbacks, but we are just saying as a nation, our indivisibility remains sacrosanct. So the way forward in your few words by way of closing thoughts. What's the problem? Okay, we lost the sound from uh, Benin. As soon as the sound or audio is restored, we'll get back to Benin. And let's go to Mazukuru. Mazukuru, by way of conclusion, what's the way forward? For our, our sense of values. Yes, there is corruption in high places. The elite doesn't seem to give us uh, what, we, what we want, including myself as a university professor. There is um, everywhere you, people are talking about education. There's so much, we have a proliferation of universities. And um, I do not think that is what we, what we want. We need to expand the facilities in the existing universities. We need to equip those universities. We need to improve facilities, material and human, in the existing universities. We don't need uh, more universities for now. And um, we should reduce misgovernance, because that is the problem why people are clamoring for more states, more local governments, and all that. There's so much of this true. If we can improve on some of those things, our sense of values, I think uh, Nigeria will continue to be, uh, Nigeria will be great uh, and, uh, and achieve a nationhood. Everybody tells me that um, we are yet to achieve a nationhood. Thank you so much, Mazio Kore Jauma, Professor of History. He joined us from Enugu Natural Center. General IBM Haruna, let's take your perspective in conclusion. Well, in conclusion, I would say that uh, moving on uh, in the 60s of our uh, independence, um, we need to demonstrate some foresightness uh, and take some preemptive action or legislation to bring about the much talked about um, justice and uh, equity. Initiative, I note, is already being taken by the, um, the legislature to review 
uh, our constitution for amendment. And I think that um, we can preemptively take on other discussions that will solve uh, the crisis which we see, uh, which we have experienced about the structure, the local government, the, um, the distribution of power, uh, whether we need uh, the three-tier system of government and whether the uh, presidential uh, system as, uh, will harbor us well in the future. And uh, certain basic laws that uh, need to be examined, like the Land Use Act that was smuggled into a uh, constitution. But as I said earlier, we are in the crisis of uh, sovereignty, the dialogue on sovereignty. If the people are sovereign, how is that sustained in our fundamental law and uh, distribution of uh, powers, the, the various rights and powers that can be exercised. I think the present constitution uh, uh, can be interrogated for certainty and therefore certain actions should be taken to amend them so that we are more certain of stability, um, growing economy uh, and um, uh, progress that will sustain the, the, not just the social contract, but the future of generations to come. Okay. Let's go back to Benin. Professor Ragbe is back. Professor Ragbe, we lost your uh, signals from you. I just asked them that as, uh, as much as we have teaching problems, drawbacks, uh, but the indivisibility of Nigeria remains sacrosanct. So by way of conclusion, what is the way forward? Briefly. I think that there should be greater commitment to helping to secure our nation. As we speak today, we know that, um, just like Mr. President mentioned just now in his address uh, to the United Nations, terrorism is there, the banditry thing is there, kidnapping is there. All of this is making this nation quite insecure. Number two, we have said that there is the provision where there should be deliberate effort to make every person have a sense of belonging in our nation. And that is why the federal character provision in our constitution uh, try to emphasize that there should be nothing that should be done to make any section feel that it's being neglected or any section feel that it's dominating others. So we are calling for greater commitment to working for the unity of our country. Number three, and this is very important for the social amenities of our country or social services of our country, there should be this greater respect for agreements. And that would mean that our educational sector should be revitalized, respected. The health sector should be revitalized and uh, respected. Agreements that have been entered into in those regards should be pursued in such a way that the incessant strikes that tend to pull down those systems should uh, be arrested. And actually, and finally, let it be that in the distribution of the wealth of this nation. There is greater equity, access for all Nigerians so that every person will have a sense of belonging. Although I said it was the last, but what just happened in Edo State, that is last Saturday to Sunday, whereby we can talk of the consolidation of our democracy. It is important that as we move ahead uh, after 60, that Nigerians should be seen and believing that their democracy as instituted is one that really believes in the people and gives them the chance to give the mandate to those that they want, just as was exhibited in what just happened in Edo State. And that will mean consolidation of our democracy, giving the people a sense of who should rule them. And when the people in charge know that they are accountable to the people, then of course we know that the leaders will be better disposed in pursuing policies that will touch the lives of our nation and our people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Edir Ragbe, immediate past dean, faculty of arts, University of Benin. He joined us from uh, Benin Network Center. It was nice having you on Tuesday Live tonight. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, and I wish all Nigerians happy independence in night. That is, of course, October 1st. Thank you. Thank you so much. And back here, uh, Ms. Nanasara Kogo, your last words and conclusions, please. Yes, in Nigeria, until son of nobody, without knowing anybody, 
without giving anything to anybody, without subduing himself to anybody, becomes somebody as a bona fide citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria who will never get it anywhere. And we can only get that one when the elites decide to subjugate themselves under the whims and caprices of the common man who constitute the majority in our populace. And that is the essence of democracy. So long we neglect this, we'll continue to have educational institutions without knowledge. We'll continue to have hospitals without medicines. We'll continue to have population without productivity. We'll continue to have democracy without service. We'll continue to have politics without civility. And we'll continue to have money without value. Nigeria seriously needs to recalibrate the quality of the people leading us. And we need to really seriously change the system of recruitment. This, uh, 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 what do I call it, this type of democratic system we are, we, we, we are running is capital intensive. It's too much sided towards more or less like a game of investment for the politicians to enrich themselves with the sweat of the common man. We need to change this uh, serious uh, uh, system whereby a winner takes all, you go and steal whatever, and so long you have the money, you can hire the most sophisticated lawyers to go and defend you, and at the end they will not have any merit in pursuing your, 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 your case. So politics should be seen as a game of matriculating statesmen. Statesmen that will govern the nation in the interest of the patriotism, the patriotic citizens. Not a situation whereby you have politicians that are only interested in themselves. We need to really change this system. There is nothing wrong with our own political setting. All those that are calling up 2014 conference, uh, national conference, blah, blah, blah. The constitution is, un is abundantly clear on how to solve all our problems. If you take sections 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, sections 12, section 15, section 16, section 17 of the constitution, that is the summary of the solution of all our problems. You cannot have any national conference in pari passu with the existence of the National Assembly. Sections 8 and 9 of the Constitution has given the National Assembly their powers to amend the Constitution. So if you want any conference, go and check the quality of representatives you will be sending to the National Assembly. These are the ones that have the veracity and the power constitutionally to effect any end change for the betterment of Nigeria. But otherwise, so long you don't do that, so long we allow money to determine our political compass, so long we allow good parallelism, so long we have allowed affinity to determine those you will give positions. So long we will not get it and so long we will continue to suffer and so long we will lose democratic values and eventually the value of human existence in the world. So we need to really change, we need to develop st statesmanship, we need to develop people that have the interests and aspirations of the common man, people that believe that Leadership is a trust. It's a trust given to you by the people. It's a trust that you will be accountable before God because you are not beautiful than anybody. You are not from any better background. You don't have better strengths. You don't have better money. You don't have anything better than anybody. You are just selected by the supreme deity to be his representative in entrenching natural justice on the land. And that is what we need. And so long we fail to consider that one, then we'll continue with this kleptonic type of contractocratic politics that we are seeing in Nigeria, which is really retarding us back instead of leading up to progression. Happy Nigeria's Independence Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Me, uh, Nasra Kugo, lawyer and international affairs community. It was nice having you on the program tonight. It's my pleasure always to be with you. And the last Belgium. but not least, General IBM Haruna, former Minister of Information. It was nice having you on the program. Thank you. And uh, once again, happy independence, Nigeria. But for just before we go, latest report from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control shows that Nigeria recorded 176 new cases of coronavirus as of the 22nd of September 2020. Lagos has the highest number with 73, Plato 250, while Bauchi, Bayelsa, Delta and Nasarawa states have one case each. This brings the total number of confirmed cases to 56,613. Discharged 48,836 with 1,100 deaths so far recorded. That's the update on COVID-19. And on this note, we come to the end of Tuesday Live tonight. Thanks for watching.